As our Landon lecture, we have David S. Broder, who is associate editor and political correspondent and columnist for the Washington Post. Known to his colleagues as the high priest of political journalism, Mr. Broder is described as one who wields the kind of influence that can change campaigns in their course and other, other reporters in their opinions. In 1972, 100 leading political journalists surveyed by American University named Mr. Broder America's most respected political reporter. In 1973, he won the Pulitzer Prize for distinguished commentary. David Broder has covered every national and major state political campaign and convention since 1956. He's traveled up to 100,000 miles per year to report on candidates and to interview voters. Throughout his career, his reporting has been dis distinguished by a rare sense of and respect for the country's grassroots. Before joining the Washington Post in 1966, Mr. Broder covered national politics for the New York Times, for the Washington Star, and the Congressional Quarterly. He is a frequent contributor to Harper's and Atlantic Monthly. Mr. Broder authored the book, The Party's Over, The Failure of, in, of Politics in America, and co-authored the book, The Republican Establishment. Born in Chicago Heights, Illinois, Broder graduated with honors from the University of Chicago in 1957. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Liberal Arts. He also earned a Master of Arts degree in Political Science at the University of Chicago in 1951. In 1969, <clears throat> David Broder was named a fellow of the Institute of Politics of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Writing in New York Magazine, Richard Reeves called Mr. Broder the most respected and influential political journalist in the country. Following our lecture, Mr. Broder will entertain questions that you may have, and it's now our pleasure to have Mr. Broder with us this morning to discuss American politics in the Carter era. David Broder. Thank you very much, uh, President Ocker. I'm grateful to you for working out the amplifying system. My mechanical skills are such that I'm not allowed even to turn on the television set at home. <laughs> so I'm glad you did that. Governor Landon, uh, may I say to you here what I said to you backstage, that while I had had the opportunity to shake your hand only once before, the letters that you have written me over the years when something that I've written came to your attention have been the source, I think, of as much pleasure and pride for me as a journalist as anything that has come my way. And I am honored deeply, sir, to be here as a participant in this lecture series that bears your distinguished name. Platform guests and ladies and gentlemen, I am glad to be at Kansas State this morning and glad to be in Manhattan. There were a few hours yesterday at O'Hare and KCI when I would not have bet heavily on my chances of uh, seeing any of you this morning, but uh, uh, the fates were kind and uh, I got here uh, uh, only three hours behind schedule <laughs> last night. The topic on which I was asked to talk and the one which I'm going to frame these remarks is American politics in the Carter era. Uh, let me be frank with you at the beginning. Uh, it is not a speech that I have given before. I'm not sure that when I'm finished with it, it's a speech that I would really believe much of the content myself. But what I want to <laughs> try to do, and you are the guinea pigs uh, in this experiment, is to not as a former president used to say, do the easy thing and talk about the intriguing personality of uh, this president, uh, which I was relieved to learn uh, is as much of a puzzle to Governor Landon as it is to me, uh, not to uh, spend much time on the reaction of official and unofficial Washington uh, to the arrival of President Carter and his Georgia cohorts on the scene, but try to do something else, at least in these formal remarks. I'll be glad to get back onto safer ground in the question and answer period, and I hope that you will take me in those uh, directions. But what I want to try to do in these formal remarks is to relate 
the Carter presidency, at least as much of it as we've had a chance to see so far, uh, to some of the broader themes and more basic trends in our politics, in our country, and to some extent even in the world. I wasn't kidding when I said this is a kind of a risk because I think the hardest thing for a journalist to do is to step back enough from the day-to-day -day events which are the grist for our mill to get perspective on some of these longer range trends. So there are no guarantees at all that uh, go with this analysis. But the proposition that I would like to examine with you, and I hope you will be critical in your comments and questions, uh, is this. I think that it's possible to describe much of what's been happening in the Carter presidency as the product of his efforts to cope with three sets of opposing forces that operate in the contemporary world, each of which, interestingly, I think was important to Carter's election, and each of which now poses serious problems for his performance as president. By examining these three sets of opposing forces, I would hope that maybe we get a few insights, not just about the character of this president and this presidency, but about this time in American politics. Are those who can in, in convenient and accurately talk about some uh, Governor Landon not be uh, displayed here. Washington Post a reporter has a stand. I think that traceable back back broken line 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 that that younger people referendum but is eyes 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 eyes
The growing thing, even the democratic, for a or 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 a in Florida, where he kept kept all the other out. Carter's is the nominee New Hampshire, Wisconsin, Penno. His vote vote that it lives sa 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 including traditional areas, it did not come from these which had been in the presidential and presidential. Of the Democratic board. He had 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 man who and 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 who
eight, eight tend to admit the pulp of the of the that brought 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 of damnation mission mission belt through Lynn that I thought this country feel to with some real were there you know but it 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 but it
In the past, when one talked about the foreign involvements of the United States, what we tended to think of was principally the issues of war and peace, national defense. And Franklin Roosevelt moved from the being Dr. New Deal to Dr. Win the War, we understood that there was a clear shift from a domestic to an international priority. But as you know, defense has been shrinking as a percentage of the gross national product, as a share of the federal budget, and the concern with issues of war and peace, as measured by the public opinion polls, has been diminishing as a factor in the psychology and thinking of American voters. What is now pulling us, and pulling us strongly into the international orbit, are not defense issues, but economic issues. And the reason that that's happening, of course, is that with every passing day, this world becomes more interdependent as an economic unit. It is increasingly difficult for a president to be domestic because almost every domestic issue that he wants to tackle and has to tackle turns out to have important international dimensions. It was significant as a sign of this that the first Carter trip abroad, the one on which he broke his promise, was to what? An international economic summit in London. The growth of the U.S. economy, which has to be his major concern, is tied ineluctably to the decisions that are being made in Germany and in Japan. If there is unemployment in the steel mills in Youngstown, the answer to it has to be sought where? In Tokyo, in Bonn, and in Cologne. What is true of steel is equally true of agriculture. And what is true of industry and true of agriculture is also true of the consumer's worry about inflation because the pattern of international trade, the availability of, interna of goods in the international market has a major effect on consumer prices. And of course, and most obviously, it is true of the issue that has been given top priority by this president and probably has to be the issue of energy. What we are seeing here is the internationalization of what we used to think of as domestic problems. And as an iron law, when domestic problems become internationalized, it produces a inevitable effect of bringing those issues to the national government and expanding the power, the responsibility, the scope and the bureaucracy in the national government. Thus, the president who had as his central pledge to reduce the size and the complexity of the national government has as the landmark achievement of his first year at this point, what? The addition and creation of a brand new cabinet level department of agency whose size is larger initially than that of five of the old cabinet departments. Does it mean that he's dishonest? No, it means in my judgment that he is pressured by forces that are operating probably beyond his own control. It has also produced a clear shift in his priorities. He's not a domestic president. He is as much of an international president in terms of his focus, of his use of time, as any of his predecessors. Because a president has only a limited time to apply, time that is spent worrying about the Middle East, worrying about Japanese trade policies, is not spent reorganizing the federal government. And just as Richard Nixon found China more compelling than the passage of general revenue sharing, so Jimmy Carter finds these international issues more compelling than reorganizing federal agencies. The third set of tensions, and the last, is deals with what I would call the pattern of entrepreneurial politics, individualized politics, versus the need for coordinated national policy. I've written and talked about it so much that I don't want to spell it out in great detail for you here, 
and I don't think it's necessary, but clearly one of the major trends of the last 25 years in American politics has been the decline of the political party as a basic institution for mediating and working through conflicts in our society. The root causes of that decline are many and are fundamental. They range from the development of television as the principal means of mass communication, the decline of patronage, the rise of civil service, and as well as some historic through conflicts in our society. The root causes of that decline are many and are fundamental. They range from the development of television as the principal means of mass communication, the decline of patronage, the rise of civil service, and as well as some historical accidents, such as Dwight Eisenhower and Lyndon Johnson and a few other people, each of whom made his own major contribution to the decline of the role of the political party. Suffice it to say that without the weakening of the political party, Jimmy Carter could never have become the nominee of the Democratic Party. He was certainly not the choice of those who traditionally, in the past, had controlled Democratic Party nominations. He was not familiar to, and certainly not originally very sympathetic to, major labor leaders. He was an unknown to members of Congress to the intellectual community, and as for his position with his peers, I suppose one of the great ironies is that a man who could not have been elected as chairman of the National Governors Conference was nonetheless the choice of the Democratic Convention for President of the United States. But those insiders no longer control the nominations of the political parties because the political party structure has become so weakened and diffused that that kind of centralized control is no longer possible or even is viewed by most people very desirable. He was a true outsider. And like modern presidents who come in from this system, he is surrounded by his own political aides in the White House staff who tend to see the answer to governmental problems in doing the same sort of thing that they did in the campaign. Now, what is the prop setting force in this case? It is that this kind of autonomous president who got there on his own by running his own campaign for a very long time with his own insider staff and who says proudly, I owe the special interest nothing, now comes to occupy an office where the ability of a president to get things done on his own has been substantially reduced. The presidency by itself is in a weakened condition as an agency of national leadership today. It's been weakened by important historical events, the Vietnam War, by Watergate, but it's particularly been weakened in a sense in its relationship to Congress because the response of the Congress as an institutional force to these calamities that have overtaken the presidency has been to assert its own claim to power very aggressively against the president. Congress has a part in power and policy now greater than it has had in the past. The Congress has a part in domestic policy now greater than it has had in the past. The Congress, for the first time, has given itself an effective institutional mechanism through its own budget process to exert a greater power in budget and fiscal decisions than it has in the past. The personalities and force of character and force of will of key congressmen has been greater than that of recent presidents. A Tip O'Neill, a Bob Byrd, a Russell Long, do not regard themselves as being in any way constitutionally, institutionally, or politically in an inferior position to deal with a president whose resource of leadership is what? Not that he is the leader of the Democratic Party. Not that he is able, through his own alliances with leaders of business and labor and other interest groups, to mobilize those forces on his behalf. 
No, it is Jimmy Carter, the peanut farmer from Plains, still very much out there on his own, coping with the world as best he can with whatever help he can get from those young men who have been his associates in this lonely struggle to the top for over these recent years. Most of the Democrats in the Congress of the United States had never served with a Democratic president until the moment last January 20th when Jimmy Carter raised his hand and took the oath of office. All of their experience, all of their skills had come in a time of political combat with Republican presidents. They gave themselves heavy weapons for that struggle. They learned to use them effectively, and they did use them effectively, to challenge the power of presidents. The fact that a new fella is down there in the White House with a D in back of his name instead of an R does not change their inclination to exert that power to the full. And what we have seen in this past year, in my judgment, and it is not an, a unique or unusual situation for what's going to come in American politics, is the sense that it is possible now, with our weakened political party structure, with our autonomous but weakened presidents, to have literally a situation in which you have an opposition Congress of the same party as the president. Now, what does all this mean? me. What I've been trying to say at greater length than was necessary is that the dilemmas that President Carter faces in his term in office stem from some fairly basic forces that are operating on the modern presidency and on a modern American society. Pitting the demands of special constituencies for increased governmental assistance and increased government intervention against the general resistance in the public to further growth of governmental power, pitting the powerful anti-Washington decentralizing tendencies in the public against the need for central government management of international economic issues, pitting our entrepreneurial individualistic politics against the need for a mechanism for shared and accumulated power, particularly between the executive and legislative branches. All of these forces, in my judgment, essentially are destabilizing forces in their impact on our politics and on our governmental system. I think they explain why it's so hard, not just for this president, but for modern presidents generally to avoid, at the personal level, frustration at their inability to move government policy in the direction that they want it to go, and at the public level to avoid a sense of public disillusionment and disappointment in the performance of presidents. I don't know, as I said at the beginning, whether any of this theory is relevant or sound. But it makes this a fascinating presidency for this reporter, at least, to watch. And now I'd like, if you're willing, to look more closely at that presidency and to try to respond to your questions and comments if you have them at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Broder, and I know that many of you have classes. Before you depart, I would like to make two introductions. The first of all, the Kansas legislature, or a good many of the legislators are with us this morning. The legislature happens to be led this session by two Kansas State University graduates, Mr. Ross Doyen of Concordia, President of the Senate, and <clears throat> Mr. John Carlin of Smolin, who is Speaker of the House. I'd like to have all of the legislators present please stand to be recognized, if you would, please.
Thank you. And now to a second introduction. The National Association of State Universities and Land-Grant Colleges, with their headquarters in Washington, D.C., represents more than 100 universities like Kansas State University and the University of Kansas. We have with us this morning a person who is a speaker on the program for the Legislative Institute, the Executive Director of that association, Dr. Ralph Hewitt. Ralph, would you stand, please? <clears throat> and you'll be interested to know that when you walk into Ralph Hewitt's office, the first thing you see is a picture of Anderson Hall. Uh, he, he has a series of pictures in the offices, and by far the most outstanding of those he collected about a year ago is one taken by our own Dave Von Reesen of Anderson Hall, and we're very, very proud of that. <clears throat> now, those of you that have classes at 1130 may wish to excuse yourselves, and we will proceed with the questions. Uh, we have a few moments. There are microphones to your right and to your left, about a third of the way up uh, uh, on the steps, and it would be easier for all to hear if you would move... Uh, uh, to those microphones uh, with your questions. Uh, be there a question for Mr. Broder. Any questions? Fire away. Uh, Mr. Broder, there's a uh, Dawning awareness in some areas in the academic world that uh, the equivalent of unending economic growth, an analogy, an accurate analogy, is of uh, cancer metastasis. Is there uh, any awareness in the, the national political level uh, that sooner or later there's going to have to be some kind of accommodation to affect to uh, reality that you cannot indefinitely have growth uh, and uh, the consequent structural changes that's going to cause in this country or internationally? If I've learned anything from uh, covering politics in this country over the last uh, 20 years, it's been that uh, politics and political movements don't begin in Washington. They begin at the local level. and. Certainly in many communities and some states around this country, uh, in the last uh, five years, we have seen strong political movements developed around the proposition of controlled growth, slow growth, or as some of their opponents would characterize it, no growth philosophies. Uh, it's been a particularly, I think, true in the western states more than east of the Mississippi, but it's also appeared, at least in some areas, uh, in the east. Uh, at the national level, I think probably the closest that we have come to having this issue raised in any kind of an explicit way was in the brief and mercurial campaign last year of uh, Jerry Brown uh, for the Democratic presidential nomination. I'm not sure that it really got articulated as an issue, but it certainly was part of the rhetoric of the Brown campaign, and it evoked a response, at least among some of the constituents, that he was appealing to. So far, it hasn't stabilized at all as a political force or movement in this country. The pattern in local politics has been that where slow growth or controlled growth advocates have gained power, they have had a very difficult time holding power. And I think the reason for it is that the issue, once it's translated to specific government policies, uh, involves some trade-offs and costs that uh, are very controversial. Uh, the issue is often posed, as you know, in terms of environment versus jobs or environment versus industrial growth. And given the general pattern of unemployment in this country in recent years. That's been a very difficult issue to, for the environmentalist or the slow growth people to uh, deal with. But I think it's there as a force in our politics. I would guess it's probably a growing force, but I would also guess that it's a few years away in terms of being a national political movement or a dominant force in our national politics. Sir, yes. do you think inflation will be controlled? <laughs> 
question is, do I think inflation will be controlled? Uh, I think, one, I am the least qualified person in the room to answer that uh, question. Uh, two, my hunch is that uh, as the American government, Amer as, as the components of the, of the consumer price index uh, increasingly uh, move beyond the direct decision making of American firms, American farmers, American workers, and the American government, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to control the rate of inflation in our own society. When we're buying the percentage of cars from Japan that we're buying today, when the American dollar depreciates relative to the yen, then our American cost of living index automatically goes up. That's something that we didn't really have to worry about in the fight against inflation 10 years ago. I would have to say that I think it becomes more difficult, not easier as time goes on. But it is terribly important, and I think historic in a certain sense, to note one thing about this administration. Governor Landon, just as people said, and I think properly, that among the important historical landmarks of the Eisenhower administration was the fact that as the first Republican administration in 20 years, when it did not repeal or seek to repeal most of the handiwork of the New Deal, it meant that that institution and that philosophy had largely been accepted in American society at that time. Well, here you've got a Democratic administration coming in after eight years of Republicans and really a long, a, a significant eight-year gap which has accepted as the major premise of its fiscal policy exactly the theory that was argued by those Republican administrations against Democratic opposition for the previous eight years, namely that there is a direct, almost one-to-one -one relationship between the level of federal spending and the size of the federal deficit and the amount of inflation in the American economy. Jimmy Carter accepts that proposition almost as fully as Bill Simon did. And that says something to me about a significant shift in the sort of the political or economic climate of our country. Yes, sir. Uh, given the institutional changes that you pointed to and the countervailing uh, forces uh, that are working on Jimmy, uh, what do you predict for his future? The question is, uh, given these forces that are operating on uh, Jimmy Carter, what uh, can one predict for his future? Uh, I have an unbroken record of bum predictions, so I don't, uh, I, I'm trying to get out of that game. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it is impossible for a president to survive politically, even under these adverse forces that I've been trying to uh, describe. I think it takes a greater level of skill or nimbleness than this administration has shown thus far. They are perceived, I think, by an increasing number of people as being sort of a constantly swiveling, buffeted about sort of a government rather than one which is in command of those forces. Uh, I think that's probably an accurate perception because I don't think they had any sense of what they were getting into in terms of the difficulty of their relationships with Congress, the difficulty of their efforts to control the bureaucracy, the difficulty of, that would be entailed in attempt, their attempts to manage the economy. I think that it has been a year of very hard lessons for this administration. On the other hand, the one thing that Jimmy Carter plainly is not is dumb, nor are most of the people around him. And I doubt that they are going to make all of the same mistakes the second year that they made the first year. I think they're going to have difficulty shifting gears. I think they're going to have a hard time sort of reducing their agenda of objectives to the relatively small number which they have a reasonable crack at achieving and managing. But, well, just to follow on that point. Because I think it's going to be hard for them to shift gears, I would guess that there's going to be a perception 
of their being politically off balance and governmentally off balance frequently during this coming year. I would guess that that's going to create a climate in which the Republicans ought to do reasonably well in the midterm election. Although how many gains they may make in congressional seats is very hard to judge because, as you know, congressional incumbents, most of them now Democrats, have given themselves such a range of perquisites of office, staff and travel and communications and so on, that uh, they're almost as secure as an incumbent union uh, president uh, uh, is. But uh, I think at the state level, the Republicans ought to do have a reasonably good year. But I would remind you, you know, that even the Nixon administration was in rough shape after the midterm elections of 1970. But a president has an opportunity, and they have a great incentive at that point, to think about what changes they have to make, because they know that the next time they're going to be on the ballot themselves. And that tends to concentrate their facilities, mental facilities, in a powerful way. And I don't uh, put it uh, be at all beyond uh, the, the possibility that even if Mr. Carter has a second year almost as rough as his first, that he could still get his act together in time to get himself reelected in, in 1980. You've been listening to an address by and a question and answer period with David Broder, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Washington Post. Broder speaking in the series of landed lectures on public issues at Kansas State University. The topic of his address, American Politics in the Carter Era. The broadcast originated from McCain Auditorium on the campus of Kansas State University, produced by Extension Radio Television Film at KSU, technical supervision by Del Staub and Ron Jones. Ralph Titus speaking. This is the K-State Radio Network. And this is KSAC, the 5,000-watt voice of Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. Stay tuned to KSAC for All Things Considered, coming up from National Public Radio at 4 o'clock.